good evening to everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this uh, Guardian Live event. I'm Laura Spinney. I'm a science journalist and I'm your host for the next hour. And I am really truly delighted to be joined this evening by uh, the historian Sir Simon Sharma. Um, beaming in from home at New York, I think, Simon. Um, now, Simon is a uh, professor of art history and history at Columbia University in New York, but um, I think he's better known to most of us as uh, um, one of the foremost communicators of, of history of his generation. And um, that, that's the part of him that we're interested in, in tonight. Um, he's the author of no fewer than 20 books that have been translated into all kinds of languages and won all kinds of awards. Um, he's written and presented more than 50 films for the BBC on everything from Tolstoy to American politics. Um, and the most recent of which was the History of Now series on um, BBC Two, uh, which I think was perhaps the rawest, most personal yet, at least that I've seen. Um, and that was uh, aired last autumn. Um, and we're here this evening to discuss, though, not a series, but a book, his 20th. Um, and this book is A Child of COVID, um, conceived during the pandemic and published last May by Simon and Schuster. It's called Foreign Bodies, Pandemics, Vaccines and the Health of Nations. And Simon has very kindly agreed to talk to us about it. So welcome, Simon, and thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. It's a pleasure. So um, just before we get started, I'm going to uh, just quickly explain how the evening will unfurl. Simon and I are going to talk for about 35 minutes. Um, and after that, we'll open up the discussion to the floor and to uh, your audience questions. Um, we really, really want to hear from you. So, so please start sending those questions now or whenever you feel like it during Simon and my conversation. Um, you can do so via the Q&A bottom at the bo a button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, that's just going to stay open. So we will ask as many as we can when the time comes and until the top of the hour. Um, please do, by the way, if you feel like it, include your name and where you're coming to us from, because it's nice to be able to um, locate some of the disembodied voices in the, <laughs> in the world. Um, so that's it for the housekeeping. And now I think, Simon, if you're ready, we might just launch into our questions, or I will ask a question and then you can launch into explaining your book to us. So my first question is that you write in Foreign Bodies that you switched from another book project. Um, and so I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what that other book project was, what and what was the thought process that made you switch? And when you went back to it, which I assume you've done, uh, if it changed your approach to that other book at all? Well, no, the, the book is actually a book about what I believe you called a culture of nationalism, Laura, which was really about of ultra-nationalism. It had a, a kind of cute title, at least I, my publisher thought it was cute, um, called The Return of the Tribes. And it's about ultra-nationalism and um, particularly about the distortion of history. Um, I, was, I, I was very minded that um, in 1989, Slobodan Milosevic, had used the 600th anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo in order to prom promote a very ferocious kind of pan-Serbianism. And I was very struck when I heard it. I never heard of Kosovo, I, I'm ashamed to say, and I never heard of Milosevic at that point. Yugoslavia was still existing. I thought, oh, you know, somebody has found a clever way to get out from under the rubble of collapsing communist bureaucracy by banging the nationalist drum. This all, we all take this all for granted now. So I thought, well, what are the other kind of non-political things, you know, non-social science things really, which has made something as antique really as national passions so easy to politically weaponize? And I thought about sport and I thought about the, uh, the, the, the wiring together of national feeling of music in the 19th century by Sibelius and Borges and Glinka and people like that. Anyway, um, I was sort of beavering away at this and it was a, and I spent some time in Kosovo and I may indeed come back to the book. Um, almost certainly will, but that's it's in the in the um, sort of no man's <laughs> land tray on my yes. desk. <laughs> but I was getting more and more depressed by this. And then along came the pandemic and I thought, okay, um, I was sort of grasping for some moment when actually 
um, self-evident national interest would be superseded by sheer collective self-interest. I thought, right, the founding of the World Health Organization in 1948, the first specialized agency of the United Nations, that's got to be one. In a way, it was, but it only was because it wasn't really thought of as terribly important in on the overall agenda of the United Nations. But it did take me to the a sort of website of, of the WHO, which turned out to have a really good archive of documents about potential predecessors. And I'm still thinking, okay, in COVID time, necessarily, this is how, you know, how naive a chump I was really, there'd have to be global collaboration about the procurement, the development and procurement of vaccines, because as Heberiesus, the head of WHO says, a little hyperbolically, until everybody is safe, no one is safe. And that that, that turned out empirically to be true. Um, the least vaccinated populations present the most opportunities for viral mutation, and as you know. So here I, I'm beavering away online, lockdown, really in the state of just sort of undergraduate learning in this, it, it, this strange world of early public health and found something called the, which I'd never heard of, um, I don't know if you had either, the International Sanitary Conferences of the 19th century, you probably had, essentially brought together to fight cholera and then yellow fever and then bubonic plague, Black Death, which makes a big comeback in Asia at the end of the 19th century. Hmm. And one of the movers and shakers of the International Sanitary Conferences, which were held every three or four years, turned out to be Marcel Proust's father, <laughs> Adrian Proust, at which point the kind of mad, you know, wannabe novelist in me really sat up very straight and thought, this is very weird, because I'd always thought about him as a kind of joke doctor, you know, someone who, who also the father to one of the most hypochondriac sons, you know, people in all literature. Yeah. Then, then I dove into it, and I dove into one particular paradox I thought which came out very well from from his own life because he was trying to establish international cooperation to shut down shipping shut mm. down commercial shipping because mm. he believed correctly that cholera was contagious it arose from local sites which were fecally contaminated but anything that could be you know soiled really without without knowing the virology without having the science yet he understood absolutely that the soiled upholstery of a carriage or uh, you know the fixtures and fittings of ships would actually carry what would turn out to be the dangerous pathogen so he understood weirdly that the more modern the world became the more vulnerable we were to microbes hitching a ride on these, you know, super improved communications. And that was the point where a sort of dim light bulb went on. And I leaned over the table, talked to my scientist wife about it and said, you know, is there something to really work at and hear perhaps write about? And so it came about. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, it, the book is um, incredibly wide ranging. Um, uh, I mean, you cover uh, many infectious diseases, deadly diseases, small cholera, plague and some others. And you talk about the efforts to develop vaccines against them, public health um, uh, efforts to contain them. Um, but you also pull out certain individuals. So Proust is one of them. And I, I think more more prominently, Waldemar Hafkin, this gun-toting Jewish microbiologist from Odessa who develops vaccines to cholera and plague, and not only that, but actually goes out into the world and deliver them. Um, so I wondered if you could talk about just how you, a little bit about how you conceived the book, and because in some ways it's a book within a book, because you stay with Hafkin much longer than his, the bulk of his scientific work is done. So um, how did you think about it, and is he, was he just a device to move the story on, or was he, were you truly um, fascinated in him by himself? No, I mean, that's, uh, I, I, I should back up a little on, on that question, if that's okay, it is, is that I did think, and again, maybe, you know, we, we've abandoned great, um, great women and men ideas about changing the world completely. And, you know, there, there is something, 
um, naive, really, about explaining scientific breakthroughs as a matter of heroics. A lot of them happen by chance. A lot of them happen as a, you know, arise from many years of cumulative experiments. Of course, of course. Um, on the other hand, it, it, it did strike me that there were certain moments in the history of inoculation and vaccine. Um, which were extraordinary, owed an extraordinary amount, actually, to um, a, a personal courage and belief in science, really, against the grain of conventional opinion. Can I say something about, you know, smallpox inoculation, which, which struck me very fiercely about, you know, struck me very powerfully about that? Um, mm. Essentially, smallpox inoculation, first of all, it's a very counterintuitive thing. Um, inoculation, this is 100 years before Jenner's cowpox, which is mm. more reliable in a way and certainly safer. But nonetheless, one in six people were going were dying with smallpox in the very earliest decades, late decades of the 17th century and the very early decades of the 1700s, the 18th century. So it was extremely dangerous. And even if you survived, the chances were you were going to be hideously disfigured from terrible scarring. You might actually go blind. You would you would lose all all, all sorts of you would you yes. would it was yeah. a, a personal, physical, and physiognomic trauma really. And there's one particular woman who I'm sure some of the people looking in will have heard of, the wife of the British ambassador to Constantinople, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, but a published poet in her own right and a very fiercely independent mind, a friend of um, the world of theatre, of Congreve and John Gay and of Alexander Pope, who was really very much in love with her. And during the time she goes out with her husband, who's on a diplomatic mission, she notices that the women in the Ottoman Empire are completely unmarked by smallpox. And she herself had nearly died of smallpox. Um, and her, she, she was very badly disfigured and she'd lost her brother and she continued to lose many friends to them. So she simply sort of made inquiries about what was going on and discovered that actually um, a, a long standing empirical practice by which um, pussy matter, poisonous matter, sorry, everybody, there's no way to actually gild the the, the poisonous lily here were taken from infected living bodies and actually scratches were made in the arm. You know, this is no surprise to us now. And inoculation happened. But of course, this is the most counterintuitive thing you can do. A lot of people around the world still think it's a dangerously counterintuitive thing. Why would you take poison, toxin, from an infected body and stick it into a perfectly healthy one? Why, if you are a mother in particular, would you do this to your son, which is exactly what she did to her six-year-old son? She had she knew about two important um, physicians who also, one of whom was also a translator in the world of the Ottoman Empire, who'd sent papers to the Royal Society in London that had mentioned this extraordinary paradox. And that encouraged her in going ahead with her own family. When she got back to England, she inoculated her three-year-old daughter. And amazingly, she converted the then Princess of Wales, who became Queen Caroline to King George II. So she really, not, so it was her promotional campaign extraordinary which which had the effect of actually making this a real possibility and a real a real issue in a way sorry carry on no go, no please go ahead i was going to say yeah so there are these moments where the individual can uh, can flip things and can make a difference in the, in the bigger scheme of things yeah yeah i think i think what's very interesting really about it is um recept receptivity and resistance to those actually who you might expect to be open-minded enough to take this on board. In mm. Mary Lee Montague's case, the medical community divided. It's already divided professionally between the kind of artisanal people, surgeons who do the hard graft work and physicians really, who are the grandees who prescribe potions and lotions and so on. But both communities divide, some of them horrified, some of them, um, some of them accepting. Um, when Mary Wortley Montague uh, made her pitch for the importance of saving children in particular by inoculating them, um, she got opposition from the clergy. Um, and that you can still hear this in parts of the United States where I live, that this is an interference with God's judgment, that God is actually the person responsible for adjudicating between life and death. He will decide. Mm -hmm. And it's called, it was called uh, by uh, a man called Eben Massey, who preached a sermon 
um, in in the uh, church in, uh, in in Piccadilly, Church of St James's, saying this is literally a satanic conspiracy. And this is exactly what you can hear um, in the madder fringes of QAnon and conspiracy theories in America now, that this is a kind of demonic possession. Secondly, there was a kind of, there was a physician called William Wagstaff at St. Bart's who said, why would you pay any attention um, to a, a kind of a sort of fake experiment practiced by as he put it, ignorant, ignorant and illiterate people. He said, history will, posterity will scarce be able to believe that a practice that was done by these ignorant and literate folks could make such an entry into what he said was the politest nation of the world, Britain, as to be received in the royal palace. Mm -hmm. So the reception there was, it took a long time to overcome, but it was essentially a division on both the kind of medical classes and also fashionable classes and poor people who are just too frightened. In Hafkin's case in India, it was it was the medical establishment of the British Empire who were against him. Yes. So I, I, I would like to come back to the role of women. I did want to ask you one little bit provocative question, if I may, <laughs> which is that um, I also wrote a book about infectious disease. I wrote a book about the 1918 pandemic. And um, the reason I did so was because I felt that that particular pandemic had been pretty much completely neglected by so-called mainstream historians and so I mean the immediate trigger was that we were in 2013 we were coming up to the centenary of the great war and everybody was talking about the war and nobody was talking about the pandemic um, and still I think people say you know talk about the effects of the war as if the pandemic had no impact and and the problem there is that there's very meager research that tries to distinguish the effects of the two things which coincided in time so um, I, I just wondered if having written this book you had you agreed with me that pandemics had been neglected by historians in the main, and if you changed your ideas about them and the role that they played in human affairs. Well, I think I think that there's been a, you know, there's obviously been a rich literature about the Black Death, medieval Black Death. There has certainly not really been a rich literature on, for example, the return of bubonic plague, which killed more than 20 million people between 1892 when it started, um, 1894 when it started, and the, the late 1920s when a variety of antibiotics was developed to deal very effectively with it because um, Havkeen's own vaccines were mistrusted. So I think what, what, there's, what you're absolutely right about, Laura, is the kind of intersection really between pandemic um, pandemics of infectious diseases and um, political opinion um, suddenly, you know, enormous things, which you're quite rightly right about, you know, the sort of sense of a social contract between the governed and, and, and the governors. Who do you trust? Um, what's the relationship of the scientific community to, um, you know, to uh, the other opinion makers? Above all, what are the stakes in shutting down the economic system? So pretty much you can sort of tick off really all of the you know, the great issues which still confront us in our contemporary world with ever more urgency because of the many existential crises we're facing. And pandemic diseases suddenly absolutely intensifies, you know, uh, the, the attention that we've got to give to those huge topics. It it twists them out of kilter. We think of it now, already we're in 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 our case, I regret to tell you, it's very sunny and delightful here. <laughs> and uh, of course, cool and rainy is going to be the desirable holiday destination. <laughs> That's what yeah. we've got here at the moment. But, yeah. Yeah. So um, we think of it, you know, and memory of COVID and lockdown is receding. You know, yeah. it doesn't make the front pages of tabloids or, or broadsheet papers like The Guardian, who left D, anymore. So we think of it as really something, well, you know, just a light, a bad lightning bolt that will happen or it may not happen, but it is actually something that is definitely ongoing because of some of the factors I talk about at the beginning of the book, environmental degradation, um, the collapse of barriers between wild animal populations and us. So it is a sort of new normal for us, really. So you're absolutely right about it's that. Accelerating as well. So I wondered if we could talk a bit about how epidemics or infectious diseases are 
politicized because that's a big theme in your book and it, it's what it's yeah. it's entangled with the story of Hafkin and, and many of the other characters who you figures real historical figures who you talk about so I, I just wondered if you would care to reflect on how public health was weaponized then and now and whether it's the same right. or whether every public health crisis is different I think I think um it presents an opportunity for politicization um, or maybe even inevitably becomes politicized when the antidote to mass death is a novelty. Uh, smallpox inoculation was an extraordinary novelty. And as I said, it, was, it seemed to be such a kind of crazy thing to do um, to actually take a, what you're doing by injecting poison matter into your body was to invite smallpox in, in the belief trusting those learned bigwigs that actually you're going to get the mild case of the disease which will preempt you dying and actually pre preempt you from being horribly disfigured and before the immune system was known about that is an enormous leap of faith that just had to be demonstrated from statistics so in the again the case of the early 1700s it was very interesting that some of the most violent attacks on inoculation said this is like the south sea bubble um we have a new dynasty we who are these hanoverians anyway this is something profoundly un-british one of the attackers on the promoters of inoculation said um, you don't understand you know why would we take something from turkey or greece when we're dealing with british blood the phrase british blood why would we listen when when smallpox broke out in boston in 1721 cotton mather one of the most famous um dissent methodist preachers there um took advice from his formerly enslaved house servant man called onesimus so you know uproar then happened saying why in your are, are you absolutely mad to take advice from an african similarly really when um in the years of the early years of the institute pasteur the beginnings of immunology the immune system were revealed um, and Pasteur had carried out the first successful vaccinations against rabies, followed by a, a student at the Asio Pasteur, Hafkin, we've been talking about, doing what was thought to be impossible, creating a vaccine for cholera, and then trying it out in India. This again met with the resistance from the Imperial Indian Medical Service, who said, we don't hear about, we don't have time, we're not interested in this weird foreign discipline that comes out of Berlin and Paris. Tried and true is massive disinfection. We need to hose down houses with carbolic acid and, and um, other kind of solutions, in chemical solutions like that. Burn down houses, burn furniture, separate families, don't listen to sort of sentimental pleas to keep families together. They didn't want to know about boffins, as it were, as, as we would say. They, they saw instantly that Valdemar Hafkin, who was in India, because only there you could do randomized clinical trials. You could take a population in a village or a slum or a, a cantonment, military cantonment, and have person one be vaccinated, person two not, and then you could have reliable data. So we're not interested in these experiments. We have to get on with what we know to be British and tried and true. So he came, and also he hadn't got a medical degree. That was very important. He had a scientific degree. Mm. Um, so the sense in which it's up for politicization um, is, is when uh, is the suspicion of the alien nature of a breakthrough. In the case of COVID, it would be messenger RNA vaccines, um, a new kind of vaccine developed with speed. Having wanted it to be speedy, speed then to the conspiracy theorists became a source of suspicion. But do you, I mean, vaccination itself is not now a new technology. I mean, you have this wonderful quote in the book from the Nobel laureate, Ronald Ross, where he says, it is a curious thing that the public always hates its benefactors. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that could apply to, you know, any epidemic or pandemic that we've seen. There's yeah. this 
So is it something um, is it something perennial that we've just got to manage or um, it, I mean, I have a sense in which like if, if you read your book or any really any panorama of, of pandemics, you get a sense of how science has made amazing progress. But we always get caught out by human behavior, which is somewhat unchanging. And we always seem to be surprised by it. And yet it's the same things that come around anti-vax uh, conspiracy theories and so on. This is the dismaying or intriguing, if you want to be more cheerful about it, and I usually am, um, paradox, isn't it? Exactly. Where, where, you know, the human condition is one of incomparable scientific ingenuity that can come up with messenger RNA vaccines as well as more traditionally conceived vaccines and deliver it in you know, space of time, which was thought to be completely impossible, and at the same time, generate, you know, hysterical, irrational paranoia about it. I mean, the, the real thing is that you're absolutely right. Um, I, I, I don't know, you probably know better than I do, and there certainly was controversy around the Salk vaccine for polio, and it was actually, again, Salk himself is accused of actually producing something dangerous. But of course, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to have grown up with the polio generation was just one um, slightly older than mine, really. And, you know, and as one went on, there was no controversy among anyone I knew, or there was no controversy in the public press about, no, don't take it. It's all very new and all very experimental. Whereas what's yeah, actually parties in, the street. parties in the street when that was announced. Yeah, like, exactly. More exactly. famous than the American president well, for a while. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And President Kennedy, in fact, was an enormous official supporter, which makes the fact that his um, that his that his nephew um, is for you know campaigning against vaccines all the more bitter and all the more horrifying. Um, mm -hmm. Kennedy was a huge champion of, of vaccine research support and and delivery. But the really dismaying thing is is that standard childhood vaccines for measles, mumps, and rubella, which I know your, my children absolutely had again, there was no. Uh, there's been a huge calamitous drop in take up of those vaccines as a result of the controversy around COVID vaccines. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what happened? I think was. People, as we all know, both sides of the ocean, all over the world, were lining up desperate and very grateful when the first COVID vaccines arrived. But then it was seen to be not necessarily super effective when uh, variations, you know, one, the vaccine that was developed for Delta did not necessarily work very well against Omicron. Um, it didn't, uh, I mean, I, I, I had all my jabs and all my boosters and still caught COVID. What it indisputably prevented was terrifying death rates. There is no there statistically. Hafkin faced the same problem. They said, you know, often it was said that essentially the, the claims made for the vaccine moved really from actually securing you immunity from contracting the disease to making sure that you actually weren't going to die of it. Um, so so it, it, gave, it opened an opportunity. And I suppose the depressing thing, again, answering your, your question, is, you know, it opens, it, somebody like Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, who's running to try and get the Republican nomination taken away from Donald Trump, was initially an enormous enthusiast of vaccines and went on television advising absolutely everybody to get COVID vaccines until he wasn't, until he suddenly saw that there was a kind of growing resistance to particularly mandating vaccines for health workers, for example, mm. saw that it connected with a kind of libertarian rhetoric saying, uh, we're not going to be ordered around by medical and scientific authorities. That in turn fed the notion that vaccines were developed to line the pockets of pharmaceutical companies. So he kind of hopped on that bandwagon and he's still there. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's, so it's really very often um, cynical enablers, actually, who connect with popular terror and fears, who you know, do incredible damage. Yeah. So um, just to come back to women, because you, you you touched on them before, and there are some very important female figures in your book, La Lady Mary uh, Wortley Montague is one, but there's also the doctors, um, Alice Petchy, I, no, Alice Cawthorn and Edith Petchy, who uh, confronted all kinds of obstacles in order to be able to do their job at which they excelled. 
Um, but there are also legions of sort of faceless women who uh, did the dangerous work to save lives and their names are lost to history if they were ever known. And I just wondered if that was, you know, I mean, I suppose that heroism in the face of deadly diseases is a different kind of heroism. But I wondered if that was um, something to do with the way that we treated women at that time or with the way that we treat epidemics, the way that we think about epidemics. Yeah. Both, I think. I mean, what is very remarkable is that, you know, the history as written by many generations of these breakthroughs um, is a kind of family romance in a way, you, using, you know, romance in the, old, in the old fashioned sense. It was from the very beginning a story about mothers and children and very often about mothers and daughters. Voltaire um, is the first, the French philosopher, the first person to actually write about the importance of inoculation um, and the success of inoculation for smallpox. But he takes the example of Circassian women in um, uh, in in the the Near East. Um, he's read books about it. He hasn't been there himself, and he says something at the same time, both inspiring and appalling. Says, "Well, mothers are actually training. They don't want their daughters to be disfigured because they're basically wanting their daughters to be courtesan wives in the um, in the seraglio harems of the sultan in Constantinople or in the in the in the seraglios of pashas in the empire." So he's saying, "Good," and he he's saying, "Good for them." they understand the way that they have to survive yeah. at the same time so he's both creating a model of um of intelligent rational mothers who are doing sexual grooming in, in effect so it's sort of very that's voltaire's problem what is the sort of a much much more genuinely and uncomplicatedly benevolent version is this um really wonderful italian physician in the 1750s and 60s called angelo gatti um, and Gatti goes to France and for a while he becomes a kind of celebrity vaccinator to the court and to fashionable society in Paris in the in the some of the closing years of the reign of Louis XV. And he has a bone to pick, as did Mary Wortley Montague, with physicians, with doctors. Doctors were making the whole process of being inoculated against smallpox very difficult because they were prescribing bed rest and peculiar diets. You had to prepare yourself for inoculation for two weeks before and two or three weeks afterwards. And Gachi says he knows, even though he doesn't know anything about the immune system, um, he says this is completely unnecessary. This is actually a fraud perpetrated to sort of keep the price up and keep ordinary people. And he said, you don't even have to go to a doctor in order to be inoculated. The best people who will actually administer inoculations to their children are mothers. There's a kind of humor of praise mm. to virtuous mother and said who would be more interested in the safety and and survival of their children said mothers can just while their little children are sleeping all you need is the tiniest pinprick you don't have to kind of you know take an enormous needle and and go right through the muscle you just <laughs> stick it under the skin it's just tiny subcutaneous prick the the child won't even wake up and there and there is a sort of beginning of a cult of the clever, virtuous mother happening in Enlightenment romantic sentimental literature. And he is really part of that. So the figure in the 19th century, in the 18th century, moves from virtuous mothers um, to women doctors. And what's very striking about the world in which Hafkin operates in Mumbai, in Bombay, and Calcutta um, uh, 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 at that time is that um, he is a tremendous champion of um, of not just uh, creating Indian Indian women doctors, but bringing European women doctors out to India, um, but but also trying to make sure that, you know, that, that there's a campaign which makes this thing understandable and he can sort of disarm the fears of families. Um, the woman you talk about called Edith Courthorn, um, is said by Hafkin to have administered a thousand vaccines mm. against bubonic plague a day 
in a very, very badly stricken area of the Carnatic where she's working. And she's presented to both Hafkin and Ronald Ross as an extraordinary kind of heroic example, as is Edith Peachy. So this is the first generation of women who had to really crash through the doors of male prejudice in the medical profession in Europe anyway, who are taking incredible chances going out to really you know, terribly infected and dangerous zones and going out there and doing the work. Um, Alice Courthorn has a kind of vaccination buggy. She does tours of houses and brings vaccination to people um, who want to have it. And then she also has a talk, which she does in the evening, which is translated in whichever particular language, Marathi or um, or Tamayala, Malayalam, um, or, or whichever. And then there is... Um, once the talk is finished, um, you can actually take your children and yourself up to be vaccinated on the little platform that's set up there. So she's a really, really remarkable figure. But there are lots, as you say, who are kind of lost to history. We just have photographs of them, actually, very often. Mm -hmm. I love the quote um, uh, of, from of Voltaire writing to Catherine the Great, um, congratulating her on getting vaccinated, inoculated against smallpox, her and yeah. her son Zarovic. And uh, at a time when France was still banning it. So he was lamenting that. And he writes, you were inoculated with less fuss than a nun taking an enema. I always thought that was a good line. Anyway, I'm just going to pause for a second to say um, to the audience that please don't forget to send in your questions. There's still time. And uh, Simon and I are going to be talking for another few minutes. And then we're going to turn to uh, the floor. So please do send them. And please do let us know where you're coming from if you feel like it. Um, just on that, just to finish that point about the women, because I was curious about this um, when I was writing about the Spanish flu there, um, uh, because so many men were off at war, there was a bit more of a window uh, to draw the women in because there was a lack of men. And I was curious as to whether that had had any impact on the women's right mo rights movement, if it had given them a boost, given them some visibility. I didn't find very much evidence. I wondered how you, what you thought about that. I mean, you saw well, it in, in, in India. Laura, there, there was certainly one of the very earliest um, Indian women doctors who comes through Grant Medical College um, in Bombay, um, actually achieves, she, she becomes famous as someone um, who rejects child marriage. She, she'd been, had to go through child marriage and um, she absolutely refused to have the marriage consummated at the time. She was about 12, all of 12 or 13. And actually with help from um, benefactors, both in the kind of, British community and the Indian community um, uh, actually succeeds in in uh, in overthrowing um, the child marriage. Um, she appeals to, to to British to British law essentially and and wins the case. So she's someone actually recumbent. She's called. She's someone who actually um, absolutely bridges. Um, you know, makes a, a qualitative difference. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, so the two are absolutely linked. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, on the one hand, um, there is a, 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 a violent resistance, understandable resistance in both the Muslim and Hindu community against male doctors, particularly inspecting women for signs of incipient bubonic prey, because where the bu buvos first appear, as we know, are in the groin and the armpit. And so the death rate, the mortality rate among Indian women was horrifically higher. Once actually the bubos had appeared, it, it, it wasn't good news. Actually, vaccination was already probably a bit too late. But but this whole sense in which actually the intrusiveness of male doctors or even in, in, whether Indian or, or British um, did kind of spur um, you know the the incentive to create a kind of uh, women medical um, uh, medical staff, and uh, that was it. That was extremely important. That space, yeah. So I guess uh, we've probably got time for one more question um, for this part of the conversation, and I wanted to, if possible, um, bring it back to the question of disease and politics. So I don't think we really left that. Um, and um, But to bring it back to sort of comparisons with the modern world and what we've just been through with COVID. Um, so I was really fascinated by your discussion of how Indian independence sort of had its roots in yeah. dissatisfaction over the Raj's 
sort of handling of, of, of the public health crisis, the plague of the 1890s. And actually, in my book, I mentioned how the uh, Indian experience of the 1918 flu, when the plague was still so raw in memory, kind of fueled that movement. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's incontestable that we're living in a period of high social turbulence now, sort of factional polarized politics and violence, uh, even in the streets. And I wondered if you saw that as in any way, even partially a response to COVID or completely. And and, and if so, where is it all heading? Well, well, lots of big existential questions, as 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 is your wont, and particularly the Guardian's wont, actually. Um, I, it, it, it's a toughie. I mean, it is undoubtedly true, just to slightly dodge the question, not not completely. Um, it, it is extraordinary is that these this very indiscriminate military style campaigns of disinfection in cities like Madras and Bombay and Calcutta um, were designed to cause maximum fury and outrage um, because they would drag people off trains in order to inspect them for in one way signs of cholera a second possible possible signs of uh, you know the, the bubonic plague coming back so it was an incredibly kind of awfully blunt instrument and it resulted in strikes and riots and attacks, even attacks on plague hospitals. And of course, vaccination, vaccination which would preempt severe mortality, and it was hoped to prevent contracting the disease in the first place. Vaccination that was prophylactic actually got you out of this late imperial bind if you would only do it. But mm -hmm. um, the drag way was really that we're not interested and we don't know about this. And there's this dodgy Russian Jewish suspicious not proper doctor advocating it and the London government may be giving him you know a place to create the first mass production of vaccines which it did in Bombay but they don't what do they know they don't actually have to live here so there, there was there was absolutely the sense in which um you know or, or, or thought how do you actually twist and elasticate authority to actually embrace science and at the same time persuade restive upset suspicious ordinary people that this is going to be a lifesaver so i think actually in our own contemporary you know we it's almost certain that there'll be another pandemic you know around the corner somewhere and we hope not too soon um the issue is really twofold one actually can government act in good faith and have trust in scientific wisdom um and you know secondly really is the task of persuasion rather than ordering people around without i mean to to, to be fair to the british government um even boris johnson's government remember that you know <laughs> the the nightly performance of the scientific advisors really did try and go a long way to do I I exactly that. It's less successful in the United States, I think, or as much patchier in the United States, particularly when you had a president who would, you know, go on air at his press conference and recommend bleaching your insights to take care of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose to push you a little bit further along the existential route in true Guardian style, I mean, there is a school of historians and economists who think that pandemics feed off inequality and they highlight inequality. And then what happens is you get a sort of social response to the inequality and the inequality is reduced. And there's this sort of cyclical, big cyclical uh, pattern going on, which is behind all of the all of the sort of shorter term things that we're seeing now and i wondered if you saw anything to that i mean you've you've now studied a whole well, it, it, yeah it, i think it, i think it does really vary from political culture to political culture um i think the sort of sense of we're all in it together um actually did have a real presence in in the british response actually um and in the response of other parts of europe and italy for example which is not to say that of course it didn't you know strike different income groups in radically different ways and the poorer you were um you know and the, 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 the and if you were crowded together in particular the more hardships you were put through the more risks you would take because you simply had to earn a living somehow mm -hmm. so there was there was the inequities absolutely you know became 
became worse for a while, really. And whether that was compensated by a sort of sense of shared community is a moot point. There are whole whole cultures, of course, that were really terrorized into obedience, China being an obvious example, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, we all looked on as a kind of, it was thought to be a moment of the liberation of the poor when they started to kind of break out from their confinement. In America, it's much more complicated because actually we're living here in the United States um, in, uh, in a kind of political world much governed by belief and gut instinct um, and, um, you know, sort of sense really in which science is just another kind of opinion, really. And that is very, very easy to manipulate. So I don't think it maps quite so easily. The sense in which really um, the effects of a pandemic and its treatment really would be um, a spur to the development of a greater, greater sense of social equality absolutely is not happening in America now, I think. Wish it were. Mm, maybe it takes time. Um, okay, so I think that we have hogged the conversation for long enough. I would like to turn to some of the excellent questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, I'm going to ask one from Morgan in Glendale, California, first of all, because I think that we have, um, and it's probably my fault, uh, painted rather a black and white picture of science is good and politics is bad. And and, uh, and and the question here is, would you please talk about medical ideas and vaccines which decidedly did not work? Cranks can also promote medical movements. So is there a sense in which the resistance drives progress as well? Um. Well, I have to know which particular vaccines the excellent questioner really has <laughs> to find, actually. Um, I mean, it, it's true that, you know, there are, you know, there's much trial and error in the development of, of vaccines. And I, we, we were speaking earlier about the fact that sometimes the claims of vaccines to actually prevent contracting diseases in the first place are oversold. There is, this is certainly the case um, in COVID. Also, I think, um, you know, the, the, the need to really um, get vaccines done, really, to actually produce them and deliver them, um, meant there was a lot of kind of learning on the spot. In other words, we it was not really very well understood or um, that vaccines that would sort of work with Delta would, it was thought they, pretty much might work with Omicron and different varieties, substrains of Omicron, but they didn't necessarily do. There's a, there's a, there's a debate going on right now. I'm not sure this does actually um, answer the, the, the good question, but there's a debate going on, as I understand it, in the um, virological community about whether or not um, actually about targeting, about producing vaccines, which are targeted much as um, flu vaccines change from year to year. Um, to deal with particular strains. Most of the booster shots you can get now, at least in the United States, the so-called bivalent vaccines, um, which take um, elements of the ancestral strain, the original first strain of COVID, and combine it with um, vaccines that are taken from the second strain, variants of the Omicron strain. And that's thought actually to be a lot less effective than actually um, managing to target the incoming strain, um, whatever that might be. So, I mean, that's an example actually of the risks you do take in, in um, you know, uh, I, 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 no one I'd say would I think really say, I'm not sure you would, Laura, either, that they should have taken more time in getting vaccines out. There's no question at all that the difference in severity or mortality between the unvaccinated population and the, and the vaccinated population in the case of the first wave of COVID was indisputably significant. No, but I suppose that the ethics of, for example, scientific testing has is something that has evolved over time to the stage that it is now um, through... <laughs> A trial and error on its own and 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 you know there have been some scandalous things that have happened in the past I, I can talk historically about that a little bit you know more more my um authentic credential I guess in that what is very what was very surprising to me and amazing and people have written very well about it is that as soon as smallpox inoculation really gets going um in even in the middle of the 1720s um, there are extraordinary statistical surveys taken of actually how effective smallpox inoculation was, and not just in London. Um, one of the chapters, as you know, 
of the book features uh, Halifax, Yorkshire, doctor called Thomas Nettleton, who was the first person to really um, do, uh, to actually survey street by street, house by house in Halifax itself and the villages and small towns around it, who's been vaccinated, who's been inoculated, who hasn't, what the mortality rate is. The problem there, and it was known to be a problem, were all sorts of independent variables. You know, um, had children been ill before, um, who was a little better off in terms of their diet, who therefore who was in terms of their metabolism better able to um, make best use of inoculation. What is extraordinary about Valdemar Hafkin in India, he goes to India precisely in order to do with what we now call randomized clinical trials. And I was saying a bit earlier on, he could take, and we have one thing you cannot fault the British Rajas is they hoover up data absolutely insatiably and unstoppably. So we know even, you know, within the space of two houses in a busti or slum in Calcutta, um, of people who've lived in identical circumstances, how they fared with mm. cholera vaccination and without it. So in some sense, there is a lot of learning on the spot, really. Mm. And I think you have a kind of notional sense of, you know, an unlimited number. What is what is untrue, what is absolutely categorically untrue about the anti-vaccination um, suspicions that are currently circulating in, in parts of the United States is to say, well, um, these, these uh, particularly messenger RNA vaccines were rolled out without adequate trials. That is simply factually untrue. They were rigorously and thoroughly tested and tried in exactly that kind of way before they were made available to the public. Mm -hmm. So um, here's a question from Anonymous. Have borders always played a role in the hunt for vaccines and medicine or has this become more prevalent in modern times? I mean, that's interesting because borders haven't really also played, played a part. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch it. Borders. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm. Um, sorry, finish yeah. your... Yeah. Well, just have borders always played a role in the hunt for vaccines and, and medicine? Also, I suppose, more generally in the containment of disease, if I can ad adapt the question, or has this become more prevalent in modern times? I mean, to me, this question is getting... Well, at the we mean the borders. creation of borders or the dismantling of borders? Well, borders, I mean, the modern nation state, right, is a relatively recent... Right. The pandemics and, and epidemics are older than that. So, uh, um, I mean, maybe you could just speak to how borders are... You know, not weaponized are instrumentalized in the fight against uh, um, I, pandemics and the. I think very early on, um, certainly by the time cholera becomes a killer in the in the eighteen hundreds, that's something Adrian Proust is very eloquent about in large number of kind of books he writes about the subject. Uh, borders are seen um, as an illusion. Essentially, he himself goes to the border between, which is a super hot zone for cholera, um, between Russia and Persia, as it then was Iran, and um, down the Caspian Sea, um, and um, goes and talks to governments both both in Ru in in Russia and in Iran in Persia, because he actually sees the reason that he is so gung ho about the so called international sanitary conference is that this can only be done um, by uh, by understanding that microbes as they as he eventually does learn about that but pathogens essentially know no borders at all um, mm -hmm. then respecters of custom boxes on the other hand you do need nation states to agree to shut down uh, communications and trade and shipping in effect quarantine zone so it's a tremendous paradox overall you know that's where i i started it's um it's a sort of deep exercise in the meaninglessness of borders really that doesn't to say that it's not entirely understandable so say in the book is that uh, terrified national governments aren't going to seek nowadays in particular the procurement of vaccines first and foremost for their own local populations it's different in the case if you have to be living in New Zealand but if you live in a kind of enormous continuous landmass then actually I think pandemics have the function of questioning what borders actually are rather than the other way around I'm going to ask you a very cheeky question now, because I got an email today from a speechwriter in the US uh, Department of Health, and he was asking for um, a historical point of view 
on uh on what he he wondered if i considered health diplomacy to be different from traditional diplomacy and he was said he was playing with the idea and i quote that even if or when countries are at odds they still work together with the health and well-being of citizens in mind that includes everything from sharing information to working together to develop new technologies etc i presume that they're thinking about the um, ongoing process to develop a so-called pandemic treaty uh, i definitely have a slightly more less rosy view than he does but maybe you would like to speak to that no i think he's written the speech already it, it sounds <laughs> much like the kind of manifestos that went literally in manifestos um but the rather kind of moving statements that were produced by the world health organization on its founding in 1948 mm -hmm. so in the same sense there was a very starry-eyed view about no more great pan-continental wars and so on and cooperation in developing even catastrophically annihilated economies like germany um the, the the same notion that there'd be a kind of world brotherhood of dealing with this with um with infectious diseases was another example of possibly utopian you know ut utopian thinking really which doesn't mean to say that in practical terms minimal kinds of cooperation well more than minimal kinds of cooperation is not absolutely the condition really of um dealing effectively with the containment and treatment of these terrifying um and there, there was an extraordinary moment you know the most extraordinary and the most depressing moment um it was reversed eventually was then um boris johnson decided to pull the united kingdom out of the early warning pool of information about pandemics that had been developed by the eu even though the eu expressly said never mind about brexit actually you will of course want to be part of this shared pool of epidemiological information and the first instinct of boris johnson was saying no we don't goodbye talk yeah. about you know, shooting yourself in the foot he reversed it but not for a while and I thought this is absolutely idiotic you know yeah. there is sort of I mean and yet we went into the WHO we went into COVID rather with the the WHO woefully under resourced yeah. and Trump you know pulling US out and so on and, and it very quickly gets seen as a sort of political arena in this case for the mainly well, at least I saw as the sort of uh, kind of proxy for the US China trade war and um and I, I I just wondered if there's a way that we can get past that um or is it something that's cyclical and we just have to be hit too hard by a pandemic no. I would love there to be a total reboot, really. You don't want to actually abolish the WHO and reset, but there really has to be a, a reboot um, in terms of what's possible. Um, you know, also the, um, the, the program actually in which vaccines would be bought up and distributed um, at low cost to developing countries was... Uh, you know, had a very hard time meeting its targets, actually, for a while, it didn't meet them at all, actually. So um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I think there has to be the kind of um, pandemic equivalent of, you know, maybe this isn't a very inspiring example of the of the COP conferences on the environment, really. Um, mm -hmm. that there has to be something which is not simply bottled up in the WHA bureaucracy. And uh, it, it, it's a fair, absolutely fair criticism to say that WHO was extremely naive taking the Chinese on um, at their word, um, taking them to be transparent when they were anything but. But on the other hand, the Wuhan, the infamous Wuhan Institute of Virology was not actually infamous. It was actually the incredibly important place where um, all sorts of strains of bad coronaviruses were being studied. So I think there does have to be some sort of institutional organizational reboot somehow. And maybe um maybe the the questioner is is just the person to get it going. <laughs> So we've got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, quick ones and then um, we'll move to sort of close. Um, Dave and Sue from Fife ask, um, and it's a very good point, I think the book is called Foreign Bodies. Um, to what extent does the role of otherness of disease or otherness of the origin of disease influence the politic and social responses to pandemic diseases? I think we've touched on it a bit already, but maybe you just want to. It's, it's hugely, it has yeah. been unfortunately hugely proper. It was, cholera was called the Asian cholera. Um, in the in the 19th century, Spanish flu, of course, starts in Kansas, as I said, you remember. It. So, in fact, the sort of sense, actually, that 
um, there is a bad vocabulary about invasiveness and that, you know, the, the actual development of biological terror weapons, you know, which is certainly a biological military weapons, never mind terror weapons, really has made the sort of sense. I mean, I meant that to be part of what the title of the book implies. Um, that has been really a, a, a huge part of the problem, that very often it's thought to be somehow um something that it that something that someone plots in a remote land to actually take down your own defenses and there's there is actually quite an interesting paper which i cite in the in the reading list at the back of the book about scientists who are trying to concern to sort of neutralize this very heavily loaded vocabulary about um about microbes and pathogens being essentially uh, a dastardly form of foreign invasion i mean it took a long time um, and still not quite chased away the notion that wasn't just a lab leak happening in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but um, but some sort of deadly virus pathogen was being manufactured as part of the Chinese military arsenal. There's absolutely no evidence for that whatsoever. Um, and Asha from Essex asks, um, oh, no, sorry, that's not the one I was going to ask, because that's rather a lengthy one. I was just going to ask if, yes, Trish in Glasgow, I work in public health. Are there any plans to make a TV series from the book? I think it would be brilliant, especially post-COVID. Well, and thank you, Trish. Right to the BBC right now, actually. <laughs> I would love to do this, or I'd love to I'm see somebody else do it. I would love to see, yes. Persuasiveness is absolutely crucial, I think. Okay. Well, we've sadly run out of time, but I hope we were able to answer, um, if not all, um, a good portion of your excellent questions. Um, I'd just like to encourage you, if you haven't already, to get yourself a copy of Simon's brilliant book, which is fan fantastically written and, uh, um, and really fascinating from beginning to end. You won't regret it. Um, my thanks to everyone who tuned in tonight. Uh, if you can face it, please do fill out our survey at the end because it helps us to improve. And if you enjoyed this conversation, then do look at the Guardian Live um, program because you might well find other events that you find um, stimulating. Uh, and so last, but, oh, and also the book is available on the Guardian Bookshop um, and of course at all good bookshops. Um, but last but certainly not least, I'd love to express my huge thanks to Simon Sharma. Um, for Sir Simon Sharma, excuse me, for giving so generously of his time this evening, um, right. and for sharing us with his with us his thoughts on a subject that, whether we like it or not, has affected our lives quite profoundly in recent years. So thanks again, Simon, and uh, thanks to all of you. Thank you, Guardian. Yeah. <laughs> and goodbye. Bye bye.